You're listening to Well Met. Well Met. A Hearthstone podcast brought to you by blizzpro.com. Well Met. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 77 of Well Met. We are a Hearthstone podcast brought to you by blizzpro.com. From Denver, Colorado, I am John Horstman. With me, of course, is the crew. First, from Saskatoon, Canada, it's Kevin Avdestad. Hey, Kev. What's up, John? Going to be a crazy show this week. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to spending some time on a topic we don't necessarily get to do a lot of talking about, which is arena. Good, good so, play. Oh, yeah. Arena. Never mind. That too. <laughs> that, that too. Uh, All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> but no, we we've always talked about wanting to spend a little more time on arena. We get lots of emails and requests for that. And this week, given the obvious, uh, and we'll get to that if you're not uh, clear on what's going on. It's finally time for us to really kind of dig into it. So it's going to be a fun show. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm really excited for this show. Before we get rolling, though, let's head over to Kansas City with J.R. Cook. Hey, J.R. Hey, guys. It's good to be back after a week long vacation of going to Atlanta, Georgia and heading out to Dragon Con. Um, if you guys have never been to Dragon Con before, this was my fifth year there. And I was just there for fun, like I am every year. And uh, you should definitely go to Dragon Con sometime because it is a convention unlike any other I've ever been to. Uh, I rank it above BlizzCon, I'm sorry. But just because just because it is about the fans, about the community, about just hanging out, drinking some beers, and having a good time, which BlizzCon sort of becomes as well but dragon con is like a whole different beast pun intended i like it yeah <laughs> i don't know if John's i'm gonna talk to you weird. for the rest of this show why i don't know i don't i just i don't like you calling out blizzcon like that on a blizzard podcast hey i, I blizzcon's right up there it's the second one dragon con know. for me though is amazing Send your emails making fun of JR to wellmet at blizzpro.com. I'll read them on the show next week. They have to be appropriate, but they can be about how much better BlizzCon is from DragonCon. Hang on Go one second. I'm that. typing up my uh, my email right now. Oh, <laughs> Just say it, man. Just say it. <laughs> Let's talk about our weeks in Hearthstone. I'm sure they have been glamorous. Uh, Kev, let's start with you, man. Glamorous is a strong word. Uh, the little bit of time I did get to spend on Hearthstone this week was split pretty evenly between doing a little bit of messing around, helping some friends make some new decks now that Karazhan is done and dusted. People are trying to make new things work with the cards they've decided that interest them. So just some experimental stuff on the ladder. And uh, I did a little very quietly over on my Twitch stream, uh, a little casting for a private tournament. Uh, the top four of uh, a recent tournament with some friends that was pretty interesting uh, and dominated enormously by, of all things, uh, a modified discard warlock. So it was a lot of fun. Very cool to see. And that was that was kind of how I spent my week. So this uh, this month is going to be rough for me with work, uh, as you guys have no doubt gathered from all of my shout outs at the end of the shows. I've got some big projects due uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I'll ladder as best I can, but this is going to be like a one night when I have some free time on my iPad. I'm going to desperately try and rank up kind of month. That's fair, though. It happens to the best of us. Guys, BlizzCon's right around the corner. Less than 60 days. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. It's too soon. (laughs) I'm so excited. I'm really excited for this. Uh, JR, what's up with you, man? And uh, for for me with Hearthstone, um, since since I went on vacation, I was a week behind from everybody. So just Friday, I finally got to play the final wing of Karazhan finally and uh, get all those cards unlocked, play through Heroic, get that through. I'm like, OK, what what am I going to play with right now? And I decided to go with the fun and interactive Hunter because Barnes and Yasharaj and good times and uh 
it was it was a pretty fun deck. I I enjoyed it for the most part. It's cheesy. If you don't get the combo, it's not as fun. If you get the combo, you get to kind of laugh and feel sorry for your opponent. But uh, I didn't get ranked up very far with it. I, I I wasn't very good with the deck. I probably had fifty five percent win rate with it, uh, which is which is good, but not it's like fine, yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's good it's at like once you've ranked amazing. up. Yeah, yeah, it's right. good and it's fine if you're having fun right i'll take a 55 right. win or 55 percent deck with that's fun than yeah. a 65 that i just hate myself playing yeah, <clears throat> aggro <absolutely>. shaman <laughs> yeah so i had fun with that for a bit uh i think i'm done with it though after the uh initial okay i got i got barnes out on turn three with the coin i got yasharaj my guy can my opponent conceded um, after a few times of that, I'm like, okay, I want to build something else. So I think this week, um, I'm going to really push for, I talked about it on the show a few weeks ago when we were doing the card reviews and I said, I really wanted to make a, an really hyper aggro, uh, discard warlock. So I'm going to play around with that this week and see if I can get something to work. Nice. As for me, uh, I burned out a little bit. Ranking from 12 to 4 at the end of last season. And so I didn't get to play a whole lot. Um, I did. I've been playing around in arena a little bit, especially with the changes. I'm like, ooh, I should should play a little arena. So I've been doing that. I haven't touched the ladder a whole lot, uh, except in my um, ETT time. So, uh, yeah. That's been about it. For those wondering what ETT is, that's effective toilet time. So, uh, <laughs> oh my god, yeah, uh, it gives you yeah. It, it, it gives you a whole new definition to discard warlock. This week in Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. All right, before we do get started, we do want to thank our friends of the show, Albert T. The Real Ben and Coral, thank you so much for your support of WellMet. We really can't thank you enough. If you want to get involved, if you love the show, uh, head on over to patreon.com slash Podcast. Take a look at some of the perks we've got there and to go ahead and sign up. Chat just got to the joke before, so I'm, I'm reading the, the reactions. So <laughs> anyways, thank you so much. Albert T, The Real Ben, and Coral. Kev, what do we got going on this week in Hearthstone? Oh, we got a whole bunch of stuff. We'll start from the top and work our way down. So at the top of our list this week is the ongoing quest for those last couple of spots at BlizzCon. The Hearthstone World Championship is going to play out in November. And uh, over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to find out who the last three seasonal champions are going to be attending on behalf of the three standard regions in Hearthstone next weekend. Primarily what we want to talk about right now is the America's Summer Championship. It runs September 17th and the 18th, beginning at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And we're going to chat a little bit about what we're expecting from that tournament. So uh, for those of you who didn't catch the preliminary, you're going to be watching a bar dude 7597 Hot Meowth, Monsanto, Pasqua, Roof Trellin, Tere, and Topo Pablo 11 competing in that tournament. Uh, really big names there, Kev. The way <laughs> the way that you had those so lined up and memorized, it was amazing. Very yeah, good. Yeah, I am yeah, for sure reading those off the list. list. <laughs> I, for what it's worth, they're not all new, right? Like, no, we've dude's definitely been seen around. To Ray play before. Uh, this is not Hot Meowth's first appearance. He's done really well on ladder and done okay in a couple of tournaments. But it is definitely uh, indicative, I think, of some of the the general feedback people have given about HCT this year and how it's very difficult because you don't see consistency from one season or tournament to the next. So I don't know. Right, uh, Jr. Thoughts? No, that's that's exactly how I feel with this. Uh, you know, I'm I. The the thing is though, like the HCT games, like they're, especially the the championship games, they're always really fun to watch. Like these are really good players. They've gone a long ways to get here and are you know at the top of their game. And the play that you're going to see is going to be the best plays out. You know, the, 
probably the best players out there right at this moment. And there's a reason why they're playing for the championship. Even though you don't, you, you may not have heard these names or anything like that, doesn't mean they're not going to play well. So it's definitely going to be fun to watch. And ACT always puts out a really good production. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see. You know, I probably won't be able to watch all of it, but I'm pretty excited to, uh, you know, see a good portion of it, maybe especially the finals. Right. And worth noting that this go around, it is a slightly different format as well. They're playing Conquest best of seven in a single elimination style uh, with one ban. So it isn't going to be exactly what you would have seen if you watched the last couple of tournaments or the spring season. John, what are you thinking? Uh, I mean, the thing I'm most excited about is I feel like every season Blizzard has gotten better at um, the stuff that they do in between games to make HCT fun and interactive, um, telling the stories about the players and doing that. No doubt Great Hearthstone is going to be played. What I am really excited for, though, is getting to know these players more. I hope that as we finish and round out 2016 here, I mean, next to BlizzCon, you could argue this will probably be uh, the last big couple weeks of tournaments that we'll see this year. So I'm hoping to see some change, or not changes, but I want to see more of that as they fleshed it out each each week and each season. I feel like they've done a better job with that so it should be really good um i'm honestly rooting for hot meowth so uh yeah what about you Kev? how do you feel i mean i feel good honestly at this point um i'm gonna watch because i'm excited to see how it goes down and obviously uh you know take a vested interest in the the health of the scene how the commentary is all that kind of stuff but i will i will be perfectly honest i'm most excited right now for when we get to last call Because Last Call is going to be, I think, probably the most competitive tournament of the year because it's reflective of all of the events all year as opposed to what went on in any individual season. So there's maybe a little more stability to the player list that will be appearing at Last Call. And that, to me, has uh, at this point a little bit of an appeal. Um, Tough, though, because we have to wait. Right. We have to wait until last call takes place in October and then we turn around from last call and jump basically straight into BlizzCon opening week, which if history is any indication, they'll actually have to start the weekend prior to Halloween to get all that stuff going in time for the top eight to be decided for BlizzCon's actual stages. So it's going to be a very interesting couple of months in the competitive scene. And then we'll have that sort of brief, quiet period before we learn what's going to happen next year. So lots right, of tournaments every weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully some improvements that we'll see after that or some changes that they'll make to the format to, uh, you know, there's there's always improvements you can make uh, one way or the other. Totally. Yeah. And I definitely think that uh, we needed a really big, strong 2017 from Hearthstone. Um, Otherwise, I'm nervous, boys. I'm nervous if we don't see a strong competitive scene in 2017. To fuel that and be very, very stylish or stylish in my segue here, uh, Navi G2A has left the Hearthstone scene. So they've, they're dropping their rosters, which includes some of the biggest names in Hearthstone. Zixo, uh, world, current world championship, uh, Ostkaka, champion, not championship, Ostkaka. There's, who else is on that, on that roster? They've got a couple of really good players. I forgot to post the link in there, but I mean, G2A has been huge. And then Amaz actually signed with uh, Shaq's esports organization, NRG. And so we don't really know what's going on with Archon. In fact, all um, I know of on Archon is um, Amnesiac, right? Is that is he yeah. the only one left? And, well, don't they have uh, Nadia still, too, and a couple of streamers? But from a competitive Technically, standpoint... Yeah. Um, yeah, from a competitive standpoint, it's, it's just amnesiac. So, ah, Hearthstone's yeah, on it fire. Makes me wonder what's, yeah, it makes me wonder what's definitely is going on with Archon, because if you look at their Twitter page, like they kind of redirect you to NRG at this point, um, or tell you about NRG, which I don't think 
NRG didn't pick up Team Archon. They just picked up a Moz. Who was Team Archon? <laughs> yeah, right. I know was, what you're but, saying. But yeah. still, like they he didn't they didn't pick up the other players from Team Archon. Right. Though. Yeah. No, you're totally right. Um, yeah. I mean, so Navi Navi is crazy because you you did list uh, Zixo and Oskaka. They also had uh, or had, I guess I should say, Hoy and Surrender. Hoy, that's right. Both of whom put up big results. Huge. Uh, and then Archon, despite having lost uh, big names like Firebat, Orange, Purple, uh, they they actually had Zixo originally too. Um, I remember they, that. Yeah, they do still technically have on their official roster, depending on what the state of the organization is. Amnesiac, Zelay, uh, he hasn't done much, but Backspace. Um, and Z- this Z- is Backspace is just like the manager, right? I mean, he's fine at he's Hearthstone. Played, yeah, but, but he's not a competitive player. Right. But at any rate, I mean, this is a lot of big names, and these are not the only organizations that have done this, right? We've We've been talking about this as something of, I don't want to say a trend, I don't want to point fingers but this has been ongoing for a while we're seeing players leaving competitive hearthstone we're seeing hearthstone players turn around and say that the only thing worth doing in competitive hearthstone right now is streaming uh multiple teams moving away from their players multiple organizations moving away from the game um i don't know i i think you're right john i think something big is going to have to shift because if it doesn't uh things are looking pretty scary And keep in mind, what we're talking about here is just the overall popularity of Hearthstone as an eSport, which is what a lot of people look to Hearthstone to do. Before tournaments, Hearthstone was still a very popular game and a very popular game to watch streaming. But if the changes aren't good and the game isn't getting better then there's going to be less people watching that. And if there's less people watching that, then, uh, or playing it, if there's less people playing it, then there will be less tournaments. And it's just kind of the healthiness of the competitive scene scene feels really tied to the healthiness of Hearthstone as a game. My personal feelings, anyways. And, of course, you don't have to be super um, hyper-competitive for that but um having something right even when it's not like the hct super competitive stuff you know they do the geico brawls and things like that when we don't see those the house cups that's where i get nervous that's where i get worried about the scene and i i think it's worth noting if you missed last week's episode episode 76 john and i spent a fair bit of time on what's going on with competitive in general and and kind of some of the fears we have about inability to get invested in Hearthstone esports. You can't really follow a player. You can't really follow a scene. There's a lot of problems that have emerged over the course of 2016. Um, this, this is all stuff that has developed in the time since we had that conversation, but I think it just, it just fuels the point that it's going to be really rough unless some big changes are in the pipe. Totally I think agree. in the form, I think in the form of like competitive Hearthstone esports, yeah, I I totally agree with you guys. In the form of like Hearthstone being popular and uh, a, a a very popular game, I don't know if it's going to affect it that much, uh, just because of the insane amount of people that play uh, very casually is a lot higher than those that play competitively. Um, so I I think it's still going to be an insanely popular game one way or the other. But I totally agree with you guys on the competitive side uh, that we're going to see a down da- like the people that are competitive about Hearthstone will be there will be less of us, basically. Right. And everybody will transition to videos and funny streams and playing silly decks. And that's because that's what people are tuning in to watch. That's what people are supporting. So we're sort of getting what we paid for here. <laughs> right. There are still some people, though, who take their competitive Hearthstone very seriously. And one of those people would be Firebat, uh, now with Cloud9. And he's doing his own tournament utilizing a community voted ban list. So before we talk about the ban list, here's the info about the tournament. This is pretty cool. 
So it's going to be uh, September 14th, starting at 4 p.m. Central European time. So that's uh, noon Eastern time um, on the 14th. It's actually organized by Cloud9, and it's going to be casted by Firebat and Zelay. Uh, the, sta- the format is going to be standard, not wild, single elimination, best of five, one ban uh, conquest. And there's going to be a five-card uh, community ban list. So we're going to talk about the five that are banned and then talk about any others that received votes or things that we thought should be missed. So first, number one on the community ban list, taking about 60% of all of the votes is yogg No surprises there. No surprises there for removing a bad card from tournaments. <clears throat> JR. Uh, second, Tuscar Totemic. More surprising to me, but I see why we'll talk about it in a second. Third one, Fiery Winax. Fourth, Barnes. And fifth, Call of the Wild. Let's talk about these five cards. I don't even feel like Yogg warrants a discussion. We've talked about it way too much on this show already, but let's talk about Tuscar Totemic and removing it from com- uh, competitive play. Kev, how do you feel overall about the remover of t- uh, removal of Tuscar Totemic? I think it's I think it's probably not a huge surprise to people who have been following the competitive scene because if you look at the opportunity cost of playing something like a totem golem, right? You're paying for what you get. You're getting a three, four for three, give or take on your ability to reset overload, yada, yada. It's a pretty okay card. It's tough to remove in a world where there's not a lot of four damage spells. There's no flame cannon. It's tough to answer, but it's not totally out of hand. Tuscar Totemic, because it can summon Totem Golem, is the problem. If if Tuscar Totemic was a card that read summon a random basic totem or summon a random hero power totem or whatever however they could manage the wording on that so that you didn't have that option it'd be a total non-issue nobody would be worried about this card it's the specific ability for it to have that sort of one in two one in three chance of rolling something incredibly powerful that turns the game on its ear and and you can do that very very early for a huge swing turn I don't I don't think it should be a surprise that this card got uh, voted out. I think this is if you were to go down this list, uh, this is definitely the card that the most pro players have harped on in terms of it's not even necessarily the randomness, but just the power level, the power level, because just powerful. Of its ability. Yeah. 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 It's and it not wasn't that. Oh, really. I didn't know that a totem golem would come out of that. That's unlucky. But it literally is. That is. Uh, a turn that if if you do get lucky on that, which I think, Kevin, you're probably right, probably around one third of the time you get a really good roll on that totem. Um, it's, it's a pain in the butt, and it's not fun, and it's not skill-based, and yes, it is RNG, and yes, we believe RNG is good in the game, but Shaman already has so many strong early game cards, most of which are punished by overload. Uh, they they come accompanied with some form of overload to slow that down. Tuscar Totemic does not. So I think this makes a lot of sense. JR, anything you want to add? No, uh, and even without that, like Aggro Shaman and Midrange Shaman is still going to be pretty good. Uh, they're just not going to, it's just not going to have that chance to be like, really super good um so i think it's a reasonable ban to kind of make the tournament not ash like shaman centric as we're seeing right now it's for what it's worth i think this is exactly the same problem and hilariously you're going to see this pretty much every rotation it's the witch class got a really good early game curve problem right? right with goblins versus gnomes this this was the paladin problem mini bought into muster that's exactly what this is. It's mini button to muster all over again, but in a different class. Yep. Uh, yeah, and with Shaman, when this next standard rotation rotates out, they both leave. They're, they're, they're both they're TGT gonna, cards. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's going to be rough for Shaman coming up in the unless they get something upcoming. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, next up is Fiery Warax for Warrior. 
This should also serve as no surprise. Fiery War Axe is easily the basically it's it's they call it win axe for a reason and it's because if you get it against any sort of tempo based deck and you get it in your mulligan you essentially win i would love to see vicious syndicates data on having war axe against a shaman and a hunter by turn two because i bet you those win rates are outrageous um, so I think this makes a lot of sense. Anything you want to add about this card? Um, getting, getting I think, axed. <laughs> Get I think it? the most See? getting axed. I think the most interesting part about this whole ban list is this is the only uh, classic card that got banned out of the class out of the classic set. Everything else has been in the most recent uh, expansions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think this is definitely we did talk about uh, Vicious Syndicate's article about Fiery War Axe back in July um, and the the enormous differential that it had. Basically, people who drew it uh, on average, regardless of archetype, it increased their chance to win by like 10 percent just by having it in that early part of the game. It's it's a very powerful card. Uh, and, and it always has been. Right. And uh, the the thing I think is frustrating about this one is I don't think that Fiery War Axe is significantly better than a lot of the other class defining cards, right? It just happens to land very early, but it's not better, better than like a fireball, right? It just has a different set of use cases. So this is going to put a real hurt on Warrior in this tournament. It's going to mean that it, they didn't ban Fiery War Axe. They banned, they banned non-control Warrior is what they banned. They banned every tempo style of Warrior from the tournament by a, deleting this card from your options so that's that's tougher to swallow and i think a reflection of the fact that there's just a lot of people who run into this card on ladder and are frustrated by it or they're frustrated by the fact that we had four months of ladder where one in three one in four games you played against a warrior i don't think it's actually a reflection of what's good for cleaning up the tournament environment specifically and something i will say too i i don't think I agree. I think that people will still bring other warrior decks besides control warrior. If they bring warrior at all, I don't think it'll be control warrior. I don't think so. I mean, warrior will still, you know, dragon warrior will still have a strong early game. The problem is, is just like uh, Tuscar Totemic, it's if you get it, it's very if if your opponent has it, it's very difficult to come back from it. And it shouldn't that shouldn't be just for having a one card in your hand. It, it shouldn't be like that um, in most things. So, Kev, I'm going to disagree with you. We're going to talk next week and see who brings what. And we'll see if we uh, get because there's no deck list or anything. Yep. Nope. Good. No. And if so, anybody brings Warrior, I'd say it's probably just Cthulhu Warrior. It could way. be. It could be Cthulhu. Like I said, I don't think Dragon Warrior is all that bad with um, Alex yeah, Strauss as champion. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, it's still, still be good. yeah, there's still some strong early game there. But you're right. They're not stronger because of this change. Whereas, yeah, Control Warrior can function fairly easily without, it, um, without a War Axe. I mean, it's a lot of the same way with Tuscar Totemic. Like, Agro Shaman will still be good. It just won't be as good. Dragon Warrior will still be good. It just won't be as good. Right. Agro Shaman will just run Feral Spirit and Lava Burst and stuff on three. Right. They'll they'll manage. Yep. Uh, next up, we've got Barnes. So, <laughs> uh, so this is, I think, what the community is trying to vote out here with this is single card combos that can totally blow the game, right? Um, if if this card is indicative of anything, is taking away those one card kind of unfair, quote unquote, mechanics, um, so that uh, it, it it appears to be more skill based. Now I I see Jr. shaking his head, and Jr. You and I don't disagree. We do. All I'm saying is that's what I think the community is saying that they no, think I, they I, want. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you on that. But I don't like just like Warax and uh, Tuscar Totemic and Barnes, like 
they're just those types of cards where there's nothing you can do to defend yourself from a Barnes or play around a Barnes into a Yasharaj, right? There's nothing you can do from a board wipe from Yogg-Saron. Um, and, and so, like, I, I think that's what we're seeing here. I think that's the pattern. I'd be curious to what you guys think. I think with Barnes, like, I, I think if you'd waited a month and had this tournament, I don't think Barnes makes this list. I think Barnes is on this list just because it's very fresh, very new, and people have been playing around with it. Like I said, you know, playing the fun and interactive Hunter, getting Yasharaj. Um, I don't know if this makes a list in a month. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with this ban needing to be made right now. Um, I think there are other cards that the community could have voted for in its place. Kevin May has I? no thoughts. May I? Go, right. go ahead, Kev. I will tell you exactly why this card is on this list and why this card would be on this list forever. The reason this card is on this list is because people hate playing against all spell decks. That's all this is. People have hated forever. Every time a deck has come out that has been obnoxiously powerful or annoying to play against, it's been a deck that overemphasizes spells. It's been Miracle Rogue. It's been uh all all of the like token druid into yog your fun and interactive hunter the majority of deck patron even patron was just a whole bunch of spells designed to cycle people want to play a game where they get to build a deck and have a chance to fight about what the outcome is on the board the the whole argument that the whole premise of the the nerfs to Leroy and later to patron was about how much damage could be done from an empty board and how uninteractive that was and that Hearthstone is a game about trading minions, right? Like that we've seen that commentary from the devs and the community team over and over. Barnes is the epitome of you are supposed to build a deck that uses as few minions as possible to emphasize the value of Barnes. Now, I'm sure when they were designing this card and they were talking about the use cases, they talked about some of these funny edge cases, but they probably envisioned it being used for things specifically like death rattle decks, right? Where you get some additional value out of that token. It's it's a very similar application in a lot of ways to things like Shadowcaster, which doesn't get used to make baby Yishiraj, right? That's not what you do with that card. But no one likes, no one likes playing against these all spell decks. And the culmination of all spell decks is things like Barnes and Yishiraj, things like Yogg. That's why people are agitated about it. And it's going to be why they're agitated about it forever until we end up in a place where like at the beginning of the standard rotation, when we first started out this year, there weren't enough spells really for you to run all spell decks. Even still, it's it's only barely possible in a couple of classes. That's that's what I think people dislike about this card and why it's on this list. Uh, I don't I, I agree with some of it. I definitely agree with. Spells need to be checked and balanced very carefully in Hearthstone. We've seen, everyone remembers Giant's Freeze Mage back in beta and how strong that was. You run a bunch of spells in Giants and Profit. You know, and we've seen that. We've seen spells nerfed, 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 and nerfed. I don't think for a second that Blizzard thinks that there isn't a place for a mostly all spell deck. Uh, otherwise, I don't think this card would have been printed in the first place. And again, the 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 card is actually has nothing. It's not that playing against the spells is the bad part. It's the one minion into Yasharaj that is ends up being the bad part, right? People could but honestly care less playing against 28 well, spells. You only pop that off. It's only possible you know, if you can fill the rest of, of your deck with all spells. Like, that's the only reason that that matters. If right, you couldn't build a deck a of 28 spells, then you couldn't do that in the first place. Barnes is deleterious <laughs> to the health of the game because of all spell decks. I mean, I think they made it for all spell decks because then they, what Blizzard said and, and the fun and interactive Hunter that so many of our listeners have been trying out and tell us how they've been doing on Twitter and via emails, the one that JR run, the one that I took, it is you have to build a deck good enough on its own with spells 
to be able to account for the times when you don't get that combination. Which is the vast majority of the time. It's, you're not going to get that combination. Right. And the the exact same argument, I feel like, can be stated said in the same breath as like this is the the Reno type thing that you deal with where you have to build a deck with good enough one ofs that you can have a good at, good enough deck that you don't that if you don't get Reno by the time you get Reno you actually have a chance to win. So I don't know. I don't totally agree that this isn't because the community doesn't want to see all spell decks. I think that this is because the community doesn't want to see people punished for playing um, cards that when gotten by a certain turn are virtually impossible to turn around and win from. But I mean, there's lots of other cards that exist in that space. It just happens to be that people are very aware of this one because it's new and, and enters into a couple of specific archetypes. I don't think which other cards are in this space. Cards that I mean, there's lots of big swing turn cards, right? Barnes is only swing one of turn them. Swing turn is different. Like swing turn and Yog Saron are very different. A flame strike versus a Barnes into fourteen fifteen of stats on turn four is very different. That's not a swing turn. Okay, um, but by that logic, Barnes should be higher on this list than Yogg because it's more likely to affect the outcome of the game and hits earlier. I mean, it's compu community popularity, and and I'm honestly, I'm with JR that this probably shouldn't be there, and if we had never another month with it, people would realize that Barnes decks aren't that good to begin with once the surprise factor is gone. So, uh, Same thing as Reno Jackson. If this was taken three months ago, Reno Jackson would be one of the top five because there is community bias just because the community is saying they don't want to see it doesn't mean that it's a bad card or overpowered it's the community i feel like I, I can't speak on behalf but i feel like the community is in a place where they're sick of seeing these one card combinations that totally blow open a game um in ways that are uninteractive and basically un Unst unstoppable you can't stop those things i could care less about playing like i played freeze mage and yeah i hate it i hate playing against freeze mage freeze mage is mostly an all spell deck but the best i mean we all remember ost kaka versus tice freeze mage nobody i think can sit down and say that's not how Hearthstone should be played. That's not very fun and interactive. That's not very, like, that was one of the <laughs> most mind-boggling games that I have seen. And I think we've seen a lot of thoughtful players and skill benefit from decks that utilize lots of spells. There have been ones that have definitely been too powerful. Think of the first iteration of Miracle Rogue, uh, things like that. But I just... I don't think that it's just because they're they're banning Barnes because of spells. I think they're banning Barnes because of Barnes pulling out a really powerful minion. Yeah. I mean, we'll agree to disagree. I think JR was right about it being a timing thing, right? If you were to go back to the very beginning of Old Gods, I think you would have seen people calling for bans to Miracle Rogue cards because Miracle Rogue was gross again at the start of Old Gods when the standard rotation occurred. Like, it's... It's just a byproduct of what people are seeing. And right now what they're seeing is funny YouTube videos of Barnes. Right. I agree. Like, I don't disagree with that at all. Last one on the list, Call of the Wild. Very fun and interactive and talented card of Call of the Wild. Uh, I don't know how much we need to talk about this card, but we will. Um, what do you guys think? Any... <laughs> Any reason besides they don't want to see Hunter played in this tournament? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's this car. This ban is basically saying, yeah, we don't want to see Hunter this tournament. That's all. I, I I could think of so many other cards I would have put in place of this. I I didn't agree with it at all. I I I'm not a big fan of playing against the card. I like playing the card when, I, but it takes out. <laughs> I like Hunter. playing I strong like, cards card. too. JR. This is a card that makes Hunter. <laughs> any good yeah. okay and uh, hunter that's... hunter was in a pretty bad place before this card i will give you that but i think there's lots of variants of hunter that you could make work without it 
I think. Yeah, like you, uh, one of I mean, the active face. Well, no, because um, Barnes is out. Huntress, Huntress Hunter, right? The one that uses all the secrets does run Call of the Wild, but you could sub in a couple of other tempo cards and still achieve most of the same effect because that deck's power has very little to do with Call of the Wild. Call of the Wild is in there because there's no reason not to run it because it's a good card. It's not in there because you can't win games without it. It's, and I, I feel like too, this is the same thing. And I think this is more of like a community overreaction piece than it is that. Call of the Wild is an unbalanced card. And again, I think it still just comes back to the, when you see Call of the Wild, coin turn seven or on turn eight, it doesn't matter what happened turn one through six. It's just boom, unfair, uh, you know, delete, escape, uh, concede. And I think that's just, you know, a big part of it is it just, it doesn't feel interactive. I'd say for most people, they're kind of wrong, but um, I can see why the community doesn't want to see another hunter play another Call of the Wild. Um, and these removing these cards forces new types of decks and new types of variants. Do you do you want to know? Like now that we're at the bottom of the list, do you want to know what this is? This is a ladder ban list. This has nothing to do with what's actually good in a tournament environment. These are the cards people don't want to run into on ladder. It's a ladder ban list because the average person has zero experience playing in a tournament environment. If you were going into a tournament environment and you had a fairly strong idea of what the meta was and you tried to target certain decks and certain cards, you can invalidate every one of the strategies that revolves around. I mean, all of those save for Yogg just happens to work out perfectly. You can answer them very easily with one of a variety of tech cards in the game. You use weapon removal. You use board clears. You use uh, secrets. There's lots of stuff that would answer this very easily in a variety of classes. Uh, I mean, Call of the Wild looks great till it hits a counter spell, right? But the reality is, is that these are cards that people hate playing against on ladder. And they've voted from their own experience, which is fine, because that's the only experience they have. But it's not reflective of what's going to actually make a big difference to tournament strategy. I would say the first two that they banned are is pretty spot on. Uh, the next three are questionable. Um, I would have probably put like Innervate or Arcane Giants, um, something to that effect in there instead but uh i mean it is what it is i think you're gonna see i think you're gonna see a lot of zoo like in this tournament because there's nothing here that's gonna hurt zoo at all so zoo is gonna end up being really good in fact some of the stuff that they banned is good Makes against zoo, zoo so you don't yeah. have so zoo's even going to be better um yeah. so you're gonna see decks like that kind of emerge in this tournament i think Without War Axe, too, um, aggro slash midrange shaman ends up being really good, too. Yeah, they lose one tool, yeah. but they also lose th the best counter card to early grade sh early game shaman, um, which There's is There's so War many Axe. other things that shaman can do on three, right? They can feral spirit, they can lava burst, they can argent horse rider. There's lots of other tools that go in that spot that make aggro shaman very viable. We'll probably just see Wolf Rider come back in and nobody's the wiser. A any number of things could work in that space, right? A and the, the reality is, is none of these bands make it any easier to run the weak classes, right? This tournament is still not going to feature someone who shows up and their their four classes are Rogue, Priest, Paladin, and uh, yeah. I don't know, a Call of the Wildless Hunter, <laughs> Yeah, you're still going to see Dragon Warrior, you're still going to see Aggro Shaman, you're still going to see Zoo. Zoo. You're Lots just going to see less Hunter, basically. Yep. Totally agree. Uh, most interesting to me is, I believe four of these five cards are all from this expansion or last expansion, correct? The no. only one that's yeah. not is Warax. Yeah, Warax Tuscar is the Totemic one. is uh, DGT. Is it? Oh man, it's yep. been out for that long. Interesting. It's been out since last it's just summer. Because we had Shaman League of sucked. Explorers. <laughs> yeah, we had League of Explorers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Old Gods and Karazhan since then. Yeah. But no, Call of the Wild, Barnes, and Yogg are all uh, new in the last two. Interesting. Interesting indeed. All right, let's move on here. We've, <laughs> I think we've exhausted that. So just before the show, so earlier today, Ben Brode took to the tweeter 
to talk a little bit with the community. And um, here is what he had to say. Uh, he said, reading feedback on standard and whether things will change enough in 2017. If we think they won't, we'll make tweaks to ensure freshness. Not sure yet if that's nerfs like we did with old gods or something else like moving cards to wild like we did with murky. So, uh, murky, not murky, murky. Anyways, um, Kevin, I know you have strong opinions on. Never. Should we talk about these other two things that he said first, or should we talk about these two and then go to the next two? I think these two are the ones that matter. Okay, go ahead then. All right, so uh, my my take on this, uh, I do trust the Hearthstone team implicitly to try to make the game as good as they can. Uh, I think that they have a different set of goals in a lot of cases than we maybe are aware of because they have a whole bunch of things to worry about that we don't. They worry about player retention and player acquisition and having the funny and lucky moments and all the stuff that uh, is good for the number of people playing the game not necessarily for your individual experience in a competitive setting. So I, I read this and it feels really vague to me. It feels really uh, like they're non non-committal as always like the Hearthstone team, if anything, when they do communicate, which is probably not often enough, they're very careful not to say anything, not to commit to anything. Compare this to what you would have seen if Jeff Kaplan made these posts, if Jeff Kaplan recorded a video and said, here's some things we're tossing around to try to make standard more interesting in 2017. You'd get a 10 minute video and he'd go through examples of what cards could get moved in or out of sets. Some of the conversations that they've had around the developer water cooler. That's what I think people want. They don't want 140 characters that says, of course we'll fix it. If it's not perfect, that's what we do. That's that's I, I know they will. I know they will. But I want to know how and why and not ever getting a how or a why is, I think, one of the big sources of frustration for people when we get this kind of communication from Blizzard. It's not that we don't think they'll do a good job. It's that we'd like to be involved in that conversation. We'd like to give feedback and have the ability to discuss it. Even if they don't listen to my feedback, I like having the ability to take Jeff Kaplan's videos about Overwatch and say, I don't know how I feel about this X, Y, Z reasons and discuss it and have something going on in the community in Hearthstone. We just don't get that option because this is the extent of what we're told. JR That's pretty strong, <laughs> but, but sadly I, I, I do, uh, I do agree with a lot of what Kevin said there, but I also think that this is an issue that they're not even sure yet what, what they're going to do. They're still getting the data from this past year. And keep in mind, this was their first, and they've said this since the very beginning of doing standard, that this is what we're doing to start off with. We don't know if this is what it's going to be continuing forward. Um, if we need to make changes, we will. And we need to see how this turns out before we can make those changes. So it's one of those things where they can't necessarily be committal because likely don't have anything set in stone right now to really say and if they say the wrong thing the community can completely turn it around on them and we've seen yeah. that before mm -hmm. with a lot of other with a lot of other games world of warcraft in particular where if you say you know something and then the community takes it completely you know goes overboard with it it can really burn them um, but I agree with, with Kevin a little bit that Jeff Kaplan and the Overwatch team, they do a great job of being able to communicate to the point where it doesn't really backfire as much as them. Um, but the issue with that is because Jeff Kaplan is just very good at doing that. Um, you need to have that kind of person to be able to communicate like that. And Jeff Kaplan does an exceptional job. And maybe the Hearthstone team doesn't really have someone that could really do that. Or they're not interested in doing that either. They work completely differently than the other teams. I think um, Ben Brode is a phenomenal communicator. I think communicator. Uh, <laughs> dang it. Um, but how I think he times? does a great job communicating. I think the problem here is that they don't communicate it enough. And when they do communicate it, I feel like it's mostly PR and marketing. And that's the part I don't like about it. And there's always going to be a level of that. Jeff just doesn't sit down in his office and then bounce whatever goes off of his head. 
he's definitely got people reviewing that and making sure that he can say right. everything that he's going to say. But the fact is, is number one, with the, there's a whole Hearthpone post about what Ben Brode said on Twitter in its four lines. That should, A, say something about the level of communication we're getting from the development team overall. I'm not saying it's too little or too much. All I'm saying is comparatively, especially to the Overwatch team, it is less. At the same time, like, this is better than nothing. <laughs> it actually is better than nothing. And there's no way you can disagree with me, Kev, but try anyway. I'm not going to disagree with you. What I was going to say is I think a lot of this, though, is a, for them a byproduct of not wanting to make more changes than they absolutely have to, right? We've seen time and again, they're very leery to nerf cards. They're very leery to make changes. It feels like they just don't want to patch their game aggressively. And in the Blizzard library, that feels really confusing when all of the other games get these constant hot fixes and patches and balance changes. And if they make a mistake, they just walk it back. I think about the communication style the Hearthstone team uses, and I think back to when... Uh, Blizzard's WoW development team came out and said they weren't going to put flying back into World of Warcraft. And the community went bananas and they said, OK, you know what? We may be misgaged here. We'll put flying back in. And nobody was upset with that decision. And they, yes, there was some conversation and then there was some issues, but they only got to the place where they made the decision that was good for the health of the game because they communicated with their community. That's where I think you're probably right that there's a lot of PR checks and balances and they're very careful in how they step around these kinds of issues. But it does feel like there's just a lot of room for them to improve and be a little more open because you know what? If they say we're thinking about changing this card and then they don't, I don't think uh, like a thousand people are going to stop playing Hearthstone that day. And if they do, I don't want to be the person to say this because I know that Blizzard's being very careful about it. But you know what? You were going to lose those players anyway. If all of the time you spend deciding what to communicate is being hampered by the decision to look at it as a potential exit point, you're never telling the players anything. And there are people who are leaving your game and not telling you why they're leaving. Better to at least know than to have people get bored or walk away because they got yogs around one too many times and you didn't talk to them and they didn't get a chance to give that feedback. I don't I, know if it's so actually, much about the I don't know if it's so much about the exit point, but just how the community reacts uh, sometimes. Like an example I can think of is uh, deck slots. Okay, when they were talking about why it's going to be so difficult you know, to make deck slots and, you know, there's a lot of things that they have to do. And then, you know, they talked about that way back when, and then when they finally implemented deck slots ended up just being a scroll bar and the community went bonkers about that. Why did it take, you know, first they went bonkers because it took so long. And then the answer they were getting was, well, you know, we have a lot of things that we got to figure out. And then when they implemented it, it was a very, ended up being a very simple solution. And the community's like, well, why the heck did it take so long just to add in a, uh, scroll bar and so i think in a way like if they they have to be a little bit careful about how they communicate but i'm with you that they should be i'm all for them communicating more okay but hear me out here and tell me if i'm wrong the people who were going to react that way and say oh it's just a scroll bar we're gonna do that either way their reaction had nothing to do with the amount of communication from Blizzard. It wasn't predicated on a logical response to how difficult or not difficult that code was or how much advanced notice they got. That was just a knee-jerk reaction that was going to occur no matter what Blizzard had done. But the total and abject failure of this team to talk to us means that we don't know. We have no idea what this game is going to look like in a couple of months time we have the ability to accurately likely project that there will be a card expansion announced at blizzcon that's about the only thing i can say with any degree of certainty about the future of hearthstone as a game or an esport in the next six to eight months that's exactly as much as we can say because nothing else is certain and we have nothing to go on beyond that there's no conversation points beyond that uh that that to me compared even to the rest of the blizzard franchises is frustrating I don't know that we have 
content out beyond BlizzCon that we know about for other games, at least meaningful content beyond smart guesses? I No, absolutely you do. You've had Blizzard get up at Gamescom and announce uh, the upcoming 7.1 patches and content that are going to come to World of Warcraft after BlizzCon. You've got the StarCraft team actively polling the community about... Not six to eight about, months, though. No, 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 hear me out. StarCraft is actively polling their community about potential upgrades and microtransactions and new technology coming to the client. You know that the Heroes of the Storm team is talking about rolling out additional features that they've discussed at previous BlizzCons that are still being worked on and being discussed in developer blogs. You know that the Overwatch team is talking about future content and balance patches. What could you even guess at in Hearthstone other than they'll probably release new cards in November? Uh... Are we talking about it November or are we talking about HCT? Or, or are Both. we talking about, talking about six, six to eight months from now? We're talking about November talking about or six to eight months from now? To the game. I don't yep, think so, they've got any communicated plans or anything that we could even speculate on outside of a card expansion between uh, now and PAX. Arena. Well, we're going to get Between now that. and PAX. Between now and PAX. PAX now and PAX. So not, no, not so November March, anymore? March, March, April of next year. Okay, yeah. I don't know when all these things are. So, I I don't think that that <laughs> actually answered my question. None of those, like, you can say they put out a poll to a community or whatever. Like, to me, that feels just the same as, like, what we're about to talk with Arena or HCT and that stuff. Like, that feels exactly the same to me. Um, so I don't all, honestly, all I think it comes down to is that people who play Blizzard games want to be involved with the games outside of the game. They love hearing from developers. They love having things to read from the people who make those games. They love having videos to watch from people who make those games. And I don't think the Hearthstone team does enough of that. I don't care if it's Yong Wu doing his streams, at, you know, Sunday nights. As long as I've got something to say, I'm interacting with Hearthstone beyond playing the game. For most people, now we do a podcast about it, so we get our fix that way. But that, in the end, I think it's as simple as that. The fact is, is that people are passionate about their Blizzard games. They want to be involved. People are always going to complain about everything. I'm not even worried about communicate more so your compu- community doesn't complain because in the end, like we always have the blizzard. I've been loyal for 20 years and this is, and I'm like, you're not loyal. If you're threatening your loyalty over flying, that's not loyalty. <laughs> that's totally different. That's appeasement. But in the end to cut through everything, just, we want to be involved. Everyone, like, I love reading Young's tweets, and I love it when Ben talks on the uh, on the Twitter or does his streams. Like, I think people genuinely like that and get some insights into the game and feel like they've learned and and drawn from it something more than they did before. I think it's it as also- simple as that. It also grounds the community conversation, right? If you go to talk about overwatch right now with other players you can talk about what's coming next you know you can talk about balance patches you can talk about things that are based in reality when you go to the overwatch subreddit there's actually content in there that kind of makes sense and there's discussion points that have something to do with the reality of what might happen in the game uh you go to the hearthstone subreddit and it's a series of open-ended questions. If you were a developer, what would you be working on right now? What feature do you think should come to the game next? Because no one has any idea. There's absolutely no way for anyone to even speculate. So that's I think that's where it's starting to fall apart is we are one step removed from being Diablo where we're just left hanging, assuming that they're done with the franchise. And the only reason we're not is because we believe because there's no information to the contrary that they'll probably announce new cards in November. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm 100 percent with you on wanting more communication, more open communication, not only because it helps the community, but it also helps people like us be able to talk about stuff like this and uh, discuss it with you guys and everybody else that listens. Uh, Because look at this. We've had, what, a 20-minute conversation about two tweets? 
Yep. Just imagine what we would get if we, you know, went into like more videos and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. We should not keep going on this because we've been going on it for a long time. Uh, let's jump into meta. Beat up or join up. Oh, oh no. Really quick and simple. Uh, not a whole lot is changing. Really. Not really at all. Any any big highlights you guys want to touch on here from either of the meta reports? We've got Tempo Storms uh, meta report, and we've got the Vicious Syndicate uh, Data Reaper report. Nope. Um, I mean, I think there's one interesting point of disagreement between the two, and that's just how good Hunter is. Uh, you're seeing Tempo Storm continue to basically recommend exclusively uh older decks that were very powerful agro shaman dragon warrior tempo mage and now the the two different flavors of token druid malagos and yogg respectively whereas uh vicious syndicate by contrast is very much showing a lot of data around hunter being really good uh and not so much the the prevalence of druid so I don't know if that's maybe just because it's too early in the month for there to be a lot of people at legend reporting to vicious syndicate but there are disparities. Um, I am taking what Temple Storm is putting out with more and more of a grain of salt because they have less and less people even weighing in. They've gone from having class experts for every class to only having five people that review this. So it, it feels like this is something that they've started to care less about in the wake of something data driven. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, yeah. We... We normally spend a lot of time on the meta, and we think it's one of the cool parts of what our show does. But this week, there's just not a whole lot, and we really need to talk about this big, meaty subject going on in Hearthstone. So, um, before we get started, just to lay out the foundation here, um, Dean Azalea, Azala, Ayala, Ayala, thank you. I've been playing too much. Wow. Um, or Iggy Azalea, you know, one of those two. Uh, Dean Ayala, also known as Ixar, is uh, one of the designers of the game. And he went to the Hearthstone website to write a blog about, um, about Arena, the current state of Arena, future plans for Arena. And all that I could see after it was people saying what are you doing blizz so here we go into our next segment what are you doing what are you doing yeah that happened that you definitely had way too much fun with that way too much do you fun. know how hard it is to find which cards say certain words it is the I, worst I somebody you. needs I to make you. A just a, even just a sheet of everything said so I can just search it so I can search for a certain word and show me all the cards that'll say that word because that took way too long and it could be way cooler. Uh, yeah. So anyways, we've got some arena changes coming along in Hearthstone. Do we not, Kev? We absolutely do. So the upcoming patch to Hearthstone uh, indeterminate date, time, or other details, but it will be removing a number of cards from the draft selection process for Arena. Uh, note that this is specific to drafting. These cards can still be generated by non-draft effects. They can still appear as options if you generate them because of discover effects or things like that, but you will no longer be able to draft the following cards. In Mage, Forgotten Torch, Snow Chugger, and Faceless Summoner. In Rogue, Goblin Auto Barber and Undercity Valiant. In Shaman, Vitality Totem, Dust Devil, Totemic Might, Ancestral Healing, Dune Maul Shaman, and Windspeaker. In Warlock, Anima Golem, Sacrificial Pact, Curse of Rafam, Sense Demons, Void Crusher, Reliquary Seeker, and Succubus. In Druid, Savagery, Poison Seeds, Soul of the Forest, Mark of Nature, Tree of Life, and Astral Communion. In Warrior, Warsong Commander, Bolster, Charge, Bouncing Blade, Axe Flinger, Rampage, and Ogre Warmall. 
in Hunter, Starving Buzzard, Call Pet, Timberwolf, Cobra Shot, Lock and Load, Dart Trap, and Snipe, and in Priest, Mind Blast, Shadow Bomber, Light Well, Power Word Glory, Confuse, Convert, and Inner Fire. I know that's a lot of names. Uh, we're going to post links to all of that stuff in the show notes so you can go and look at it for yourself. Uh, this is a big set of changes, and they've also said openly in the post that explains these cards being removed that they are continuing to evaluate additional changes to the arena ecosystem. So before we go any further, uh, I just wanted initial reactions from you guys on this card list. John, what do you think? Uh, I I don't know enough arena to know specifically how this affects the meta overall. I mean, uh, Ixar was very, um, very honest in saying that this is just what the team can do right now. Um, and it addresses a lot of things. And I know it, it, it um, reflects a lot of the information that we're seeing from the, the people at Hearth Arena. So it's, a, I think, kind of validation that that system works and it works pretty well. Um, but B, that um, there are some specific cards that can be either make a class too strong or, in the case of Purify, not strong. And just the removal of the, some of those cards seems to make the most sense as an easy thing. I think the real question is, is, Sure, that's a relatively easy fix, but I think we've kind of totally thrown out the um, how is a casual player going to know about which cards can't they get in uh, in Arena anymore because only the most competitive people are going to know that list or at least have it up or be aware that they can't get certain cards. So I I think that for me is is one of the really interesting themes things because it seems so very different from every principled stand Blizzard has ever made for the um in the name of ease of use and ease of understanding. Right. And I tend to agree with you. This is now the third time they've done this in recent memory because they banned Cthune cards from Arena. They then said that when they printed Purify that it would not appear in Arena, and they have now turned around and removed this additional list of cards from Arena above and beyond that, none of which is indicated within the game client, none of which obeys the original Arena draft rules, which were simply based on rarity. Uh, JR, your initial reaction. Uh, my initial reaction of the cards that were removed, there's a, few, uh, there's a handful of pretty powerful cards that they probably wanted to go ahead and remove from Arena that were probably being seen quite a bit more than they would like. Uh, Forgotten Torch uh, is a good example of that. And then some of the other cards were just cards that uh, they probably let, don't make a lot of sense to be in Arena. Uh, Sacrificial Pact, for example, uh, or, or cards like that where you're taking out a card spot of getting something else that you could probably use, which in turn makes that class a little bit weaker uh, for it. So some of these, a lot of these you're seeing are the lesser ranked classes getting a lot of changes. So they're taking out some of the kind of bad cards that you can get with that. So that way you don't see them as much and you have a better chance of getting the better cards so that those classes might end up being a little more competitive in arena. Um, so that, that, that list is mostly what I gathered from. And as far as the not being able to know what you're going to be able to draft or not draft an arena, I don't know if that matters to me as much, though. And the simple fact for that is when I go to arena and I click, I, I see three cards. And for that moment, that's all I care about is what I'm getting with those three cards. Um, I don't think this list changes any of that for me in the way that I draft because out of those three cards, I'm going to choose the best card that I think that I can grab. And then um, down the road, as I'm drafting more, I'm looking at my list of what I've already drafted and I'm still looking at those three going, okay, which one of these can I use? I don't know if not having sacrificial pact as you know, something that could potentially come up is going to affect me at all when I'm drafting arena. Sure, fair enough. And we're going to come back to that. So we're going to discuss that a little bit. A couple things I do want to note here. One is that no changes are occurring to Paladin. 
The second is, is that we did just technically hear from Ben Brode early last week that they were discussing some ways to make short term arena changes internally, but they were expecting to have news within a few weeks. And then they've turned around and done this almost immediately. So it, this is an example of something I imagine they've had on the radar for a long time. And it does sound, again, from the wording of both that announcement, as well as the recent post from Dean, that they've been trying very hard to find a more elegant solution for arena for quite a while. And this is probably just a stopgap to get to that. Uh, abs- absolutely. It is. So, um, one of the things that was interesting on the competitive Hearthstone subreddit, uh, one of the mods there, Geekalik, noted uh, that the order that the classes were presented in pretty much one to one appears to match what we would expect in terms of power level in arena. So the most powerful classes were listed first, mage and rogue, and the least powerful classes were listed at the end, uh, which is a very interesting proposition. Uh, you know, 45 cards coming out of arena of varying rarities, all those different things. But they made it very obvious that, yeah, mage and rogue are the classes that have been overperforming and are losing good cards. Classes like priest and hunter have been underperforming and are losing bad cards. Uh, And I was just curious, like, what do you guys think? I think this honestly is probably the first time that Blizzard has ever done or said anything that actually directly may implicate something to do with balance. They may have inadvertently or possibly intentionally delivered us a, a ordered list of which classes are best to worst in arena. Uh, he actually says it in the post that it is essentially best to worst. He said most of the feedback uh, for the last few content releases, mage and rogue have bounced back and forth as the top two most played and most powerful classes. Paladin has been in a tier by itself below mage and rogue while the last six classes have done some shifting around in a tier below these three. So we know for sure that those three are the top three, and then I think it's correct to assume that going from there, it's straight on down. I'm just surprised because I've never seen them come out and say something that would, like, in an ordered list like that. Like, normally, they would just list them alphabetically, and he would have that little explanation that says, we know that uh, Mage and Rogue are good, and you would be able to tell because they're losing ostensibly powerful cards but they very specifically listed it in that order and it leads me to believe that they're probably actually telling us those are the best to worst classes in that order jr yeah no i that it probably is i mean that's (laughs) i mean this is a the as far from what i have played in arena this is very much so like these you know, the top classes up here are the ones that I would pick, and the bottom ones are ones I would stay away from. So it makes sense to me that, yeah, this is an ordered list from them. And uh, I don't I don't know if it's that big of a deal that they ordered it like this, but it is interesting that they did. It's surprising to me, for sure. Uh, so John mentioned earlier, and I did want to touch as well on the fact that the cards that are being removed uh, almost exactly match the worst cards according to hearth arena one of the tools that sort of tracks arena performance uh and so their notes basically say that warrior matches exactly druid uh everything except for healing touch that was removed matches exactly hunter everything except for feign death matches exactly uh priest is almost the same except for mind games and embrace the shadows there's a handful of uh shaman and warlock uh inclusions that didn't show up and then some of the strong mage and rogue cards, uh, Faceless Summoner, Undercity Valiant, and Goblin Auto Barber in particular, among the most powerful, best performing cards were the ones that came out. So uh, I was interested that this is pretty much exactly what the community predicted. Uh, the the cards that survived, uh, you know, examples like Backstab, best performing rogue card in arena. I don't think they could remove because it's such an iconic card and so important to the combo mechanic. But uh, is there anything that was or wasn't removed based on stuff like the Hearth Arena data that you guys are are shocked by? Or what did you think about how how closely the Blizzard list matched what the community came up with? I think it's pretty cool that um, the community has so much data that they have put together. Like they, they have spent on uh, uh, the Arena community has spent on putting ranks on these cards and uh, which cards you would pick over, over other ones because of how good they are. And I think it goes to show like how how good they have been at getting that data and figuring out that data that it shows that Blizzard is seeing the same thing. Now, my question is, 
are these cards good because of the data that you're seeing from the community? And that's what people are picking and using. And that's what Blizzard's data is seeing because of that. I, I think I wonder if it's a chicken and like egg a chicken combo. and egg problem yeah. here. Yeah, interesting, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the end, I think, uh, this is pretty consistent for Blizzard to say that, um, we would rather you play with less bad cards than less good cards to attempt to balance, taking out the strongest cards in Mage and Rogue to bring them down. Um, A, yes, you absolutely lose the that class identity piece because typically some of the strongest cards per class are um, also uh, class cards, right? So, you know, that's that would suck to lose a fireball as a mage just because you're so good, you know, it's such a good card. Instead, take away a lot of the crap that uh, Priest has to deal with so it has a higher chance of getting its good draftable cards um, going forward. I think that makes a lot of sense. The question is, is it far enough to achieve more balance, um, seeing those less in those drafts? Um, or is this like, cool, this is what we're going to do now, test it out, see how things go, and then boom, Arena 2.0. Right, and that's that's sort of where we're headed with all of this anyway, and I think Dean's post and some of the information that Ben posted all sort of point towards the idea that they're not done. They have more that they'd like to do around changing the calculations uh, in terms of things like how heavily weighted is the most recent set, not having the offerings be one to one pinned to rarity so they can maybe suppress cards that overperform like Firelands portal, uh, which right now still is actually a better arena card even than faceless summoner, which was just removed. So there's definitely some, some misses in terms of what they could still have done. Uh, and I think you're right. I think that points to longer term changes. So that's, that's really what we're going to spend the last little bit of time this week on is what, what does this mean for the future of arena? Do you guys think there are more changes inbound? Like what, what do you see coming next? Uh, I have my own thoughts, but Jr., uh, what do you think? Man, I haven't, I, it's tough because one, it, it's tough because one, I'm not a huge arena player to begin with. And, and magic, the gathering draft, which is very similar to arena was always like the weakest format I was in. Um, as far as like changes, I think they, they've already shown that, they're not going to balance arena around rarity really because otherwise you wouldn't have seen firelands portal be a common and some of the other portals be uh rares or something like that or epics um which to me would have been you know a very easy change to be able to balance instead i think they're going to look at uh balancing arena in a way that there's just going to be a certain card pool and maybe it'll be a rotating card pool of uh, that you'd be able to choose from. Like they might almost go sort of the same way that standard is, right? Where you have a rotating card pool every year or something to that effect. Um, but they might also just change how arena works all together. Like I. Uh, I don't know. Like we're going to find out at BlizzCon, I think. I think they're going to ha- I think they're going to have to fundamentally change how Arena works in the game as far as feature-wise goes. And whether that's changing the card pool or changing um uh which cards are available for each class or cha- having a rotating card pool or something like that. Um I don't know what else they can do. Like the one thing I like about Arena is the fact that you're going, picking three cards, choosing it, building your deck down the road, and then playing people that did the exact same thing. And I think fundamentally, like, that experience is very good. I think it has has to have something to do with the card pools themselves. And But I don't know if, like, banning these cards straight out is going to be the answer. Something needs to be more long-term. All right. I'm going to wait in a second, but John... Uh, where are you? Where are you on this? I'll I'll be very short with this one. The things that work well with Arena are the pick from three cards thing. I think twelve wins overall is pretty good. 
but that's that's where progression ends with Arena, right? So I think we're going to see some changes to some more season long type changes to Arena. Not necessarily, you know, go to 12 wins, get a lot of cool stuff, but imagine trying to get the most wins in a month, other things like that. I think for um, balancing perspective, I think they're going to, and they've mentioned this in the past a little bit and kind of alluded to it, um, a more of a popularity card pool versus a rarity card pool. So uh, balance the cards based on the popularity and power versus purely on the rarity of the card. Which does mean, in essence now, all rarity, if they did that, all rarity would mean is how expensive a card is. Which is kind of interesting. I don't know if I like that a whole lot. Um, maybe they try to keep a certain amount um, of rarity in that. But, um, you know, limit the amount of epics you can get or something like that. Maybe they try to do something like that so that it doesn't totally defeat the purpose of rarity. Besides, how do we get people to pay more money so that they can get their legendary or uh, epic for constructed? Um, but yeah, that's it. That's it. Fair enough. All right. So I didn't want the last word, but I ended up with it. Um Kind of what I think yes, they're doing did. here. No, yes, I really did. No, I really didn't. Yes, you did. I yes, think where they're you... going with this, <laughs> what I really think they're doing here is um, the the arena system when the game came out was very transparent. You get cards based on rarity. As it progressed, it got more convoluted because now the arena favors new sets and rewards cards from new sets. And they've had to change the some of those interactions over time, every time they've added new cards to the game, they've slightly tweaked arena in some capacity. They're now to a point where they've got this enormous ban list. There's, there's something altogether now, like s almost 70 cards that don't appear in your arena draft out of the wild total card pool. It's a big number. And they're stuck in this weird position where with the exception of the Cthune cards, they're only dealing with class cards. So you're still getting a number of, underperforming cards in arena that feel bad to draft because you can't plan for synergies because you can't build a deck. You're just kind of slapping together what you get, which still continues to mean that there's going to always be a reason to favor classes with good common spells or classes with reliable hero powers. What makes mage and rogue most powerful in arena is still their hero powers. That's why they've been good from the outset. It's why mage has dominated forever. I think they've made arena very complex now. There's all these hidden rules and advanced exceptions that nobody knows about. You have to go out and basically research how often you're going to be offered a card, which cards are going to be offered, which sets are being emphasized. And heaven forbid, heaven forbid, they actually introduce additional numerical values above and beyond rarity to suppress certain cards. I don't want to interrupt you. But I want to add something to that thought before you continue, and that's the fact is, or skip all of that and download a program that does all of that for you, effectively taking that part of the game completely out of it. Continue. Sorry. Right. You're, and you're right. It's it's drafting, like, like JR said earlier, we don't know how much of this data is now influenced by the fact that there are tools telling people you should take this card because it's better. You should take this card because it fits your curve. It's not the same process it was intended to be. I my honest belief is that the only way that they can uh, make this all work is by fundamentally changing the drafting process. I think they revisit how drafting works altogether. You're not going to pick a class. You're going to be offered a class at random or a selection of classes uh, and then you're going to draft, but I think you're going to draft from a larger pool of cards to enable better selection of more interesting synergies and put together a deck that's more fun to play because that's where arena has sort of fallen apart is it's not fun. And that's why people have stopped doing it. And that I think will help them to resolve things like, why are you being offered these cards? What are you doing with the randomization of rarity? Cause all of a sudden it's not so important that a card that might be epic is offered more often because you're being given maybe a pool of here's 50 cards, pick the 30 you want, or here's 60 cards, pick the 30 you want. However, they decide to go about it. They could do a lot of other things. And there's a lot of limitations because of their UI and everything else. But what they're trying to achieve 
is simplicity. The original arena system was incredibly simple, and now there's nothing simple about it. If you're not constantly reading Hearthstone-related news, you have no idea what's going on with arena because you don't know that the most recent set is weighted. You don't know that a bunch of cards are excluded. And like I said, the point at which it really gets messy is if they have additional variables above and beyond rarity. If all you're doing is drafting the best of the three cards that appears in front of you, it's like John said, you're just going to run an external tool and that's the end of it. And arena offers nothing for interest or decision making. And that's, that's I think why they have to totally fundamentally revisit drafting specifically to make it more fun again. So if I had to put money on something, I think JR's right. There's probably other features in development. There's probably stuff going to be announced at BlizzCon. If they announce a big arena rework, it's going to be the drafting process. MAGA hmm. make arena great again. Oh my god! <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, can we make hats? <laughs> nope. We nope. gotta. We gotta. All right, go I ahead. Want to JR, say one do more it. more thing because I think Asgard made an awesome point in the chat. Draft forty cards, pick thirty, and I think that's an awesome idea of being able to draft more cards than what you need, and then you pick out of those forty cards that you pick, you then choose. Oh, 30 to go into your deck yeah. so that you can build it and make it a little more efficient and that way it might give those classes a better chance later on. I really like that idea. I just wanted to point it out because our community is cool. I agree. Thank you guys for hanging out with us in chat for episode number 77. Hopefully you found it entertaining and also in your ear holes throughout the week uh, for uh, your favorite podcast stuff. Um, emails, we didn't get any emails this week, but as stuff kind of starts to taper off, we'd love to, uh, take your ideas and suggestions and questions at the end of the show. So send us your emails to wellmet at blizzpro.com. Uh, we'd be happy to, uh, answer those here on the show and Patreon. What do we got going on with Patreon, Kev? Uh, Well, before I get into it, I do want to take again a moment to thank our friends of the show. So as always, a big special shout out to Albert T, The Real Ben and Coral for their exceptional support of the show. This week, we also want to welcome Buckeye Fitzy, uh, a new patron into the WellMet family. So thank you so much for your support. That means a lot to us. We're very, very, very close to being able to pull off another awesome bonus episode. We did our last one over the summer with Well Met Jeopardy featuring Disguised Toast. It was a lot of fun. And if you guys can help us get over that $400 a month milestone here in September, we'd love to pick out another cool idea and do another bonus episode in October. So head on over to patreon.com slash wellmetpodcast. Check it out. See what you love. Get involved. And we also are still looking forward to some updates to our Patreon coming very soon. Woo! Uh, what do we got going on for iTunes reviews, Jer? Yeah, so for iTunes uh, reviews this week, we had a couple awesome five-star reviews uh, coming all the way from Australia. Thank you, Elias I, and not like the eye on your face. I as in like you're a pirate, and pirates are awesome. So good job, Elias I. <laughs> and then US from USA, we had Rus- Rustling Yeti24. Thank you so much for that review as well. If you would like to give us a five-star review, just head over to iTunes, type in Hearthstone. You'll find a well-met right there in the listing. Click on that, leave a five-star review, and if you do, I will happily mispronounce your name on the show next week. Love it. Thanks, JR. Uh, Let's do some shout-outs for the week. Kev, you're up first. Right on. So uh, in addition to WellMet and the payload this week, I'm also going to be guesting tomorrow night, Monday, September 12th on Rally Point, the new esports podcast from Bleacher Report. They asked me to come chat with them a little bit about Hearthstone and the arena changes that are coming down the pipe here as well. So uh, if you're interested, check that one out. Uh, Look for it on your podcast feeds. It's an awesome piece uh, done by Scott Johnson of Podcast Legend. Uh, (laughs) So it's going to be a great show. I'm really excited to go get involved with it. Hopefully this won't be a one time thing and I'll maybe get to do this again with them in the future. But yeah, uh, check out the next episode of Rally Point on your feeds. Uh, Also, I've got a ton of new articles coming out before the end of the month. Keep an eye on my Twitter at Lack of Realism for the cool stuff that's coming out there. And last but not least, we are starting to talk about our plans for BlizzCon because it is so freaking close. 
So if you're going to be at BlizzCon this year and you'd like to hang out with me and John and JR, plan some kind of meetup, maybe come get a t-shirt signed. I don't, I have no idea. But if you want to meet up and hang out, now's the time to start helping us plan that stuff out. Email us at wellmet at blizzpro.com so that we can figure it out and have a plan together to hang out with you guys because nothing is better for us than getting to hang out with people who listen to the show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, JR, what are you up to? Or uh, shout outs, stuff like that. That was a really <laughs> coordinated, coordinated sentence by me. Um, I would like to give a shout out to all the uh, uh, the handful of people I did get to meet at Dragon Con. Uh, the couple of people that actually noticed me and was like, hey, you're JR from Well Met. I'm like, I, I'm just wearing my afro. That's probably how you knew me. So <laughs> thanks a lot for just so coming cool. out, saying hi. Um, you guys are awesome. And also, hey, come out and hang out in our Discord. Like, I've noticed you guys have been using that a lot more. So if you want to come and chat with the rest of the community, if you want to come and play World of Warcraft with me, um, I, I've been playing, I've been leveling up in Legion in the Well Met Guild. Um, come hang out with me on there. Even come over to Discord at discord.gg slash bluespro. Just message me on there if you want an invite to the guild. We'll get you in. Yep, we're up to 15. I invited a couple of people, so we're up to 15 on there, but I'd love to see quite a few more um, so we can hang out and do fun stuff. Why not? Um, yeah, well, as for me, still raising funds last minute for TwitchCon. I'm, I'm really almost there. Uh, really excited to be going uh, to TwitchCon there. Come hang out in Discord, as JR said. And yeah, I think that's really about it. Um, one thing on BlizzCon, I do know um, that we we will be... Uh, I, never mind, I can't say any of that. Forget that. We'll edit uh-huh. that out later. No, we won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and get out of here. So thanks for joining us uh, for another episode of Well Met. You can join us live every Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at twitch.tv slash blizzbro to get in on the conversation and follow the show on Twitter at WellMet Podcast for additional news and updates. WellMet is exclusively supported by our fans. If you love the show, you can find out how to become a part of the family at patreon.com slash WellMet Podcast. You can also find WellMet Apparel at store.blizzbro.com. You still got a little time yet, so you can get that WellMet shirt for BlizzCon. That's all I'm saying. Just saying. I'll be wearing um, mine. I'll be wearing mine probably too. Shameless self promotion. That's what I do best. Uh, Special thanks to Jake Buttono uh, for our music. You can find it at jakebuttono.ca and site designs for our graphics. This has been episode number 77 of Well Met. And we'll see you again next week. Bye, guys. See you, Kev. See you, JR. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, John. Bye. Bye. Well Met is a production of BlizzPro.com. The show records live at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at twitch.tv slash blizzpro. To get the latest news and information about the show, follow us on Twitter at Well Met Podcast or join us on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Well Met Podcast. If you would like to support the show, you can find out how at patreon.com slash Well Met Podcast. You-